Coit is going to share with you a combined optimization of reliability, preventive maintenance, and resilience using stochastic programming. Right? Uh, he has been a, a visiting professor almost in various parts of uh, Asia, especially East Asia. Right? And uh, this is uh, one of the very interesting talk that span across uh, different uh, areas, not just on reliability, but all the way to resilience, uh, which is one of the uh, key research, uh, emerging research area, right, uh, for future cities, right. Uh, so without further ado, right, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Coy to share his uh, screen right, and uh, start with Paul. Uh, Professor Coy, please. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for the very nice introduction. And I also, and, and, and good morning. Good morning, everyone, except for it's not morning here in America. So greetings from uh, New Jersey, where I am. It's actually nighttime here. So let me share. And oops, I should have been ready. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, much better. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be there. I, I, I wish uh, we were in fact in Osaka, Japan, but uh, if, if you in, invite me again some future time, I, I'd like to be there in person. And as Professor Tang said in the introductory remarks, this talk is um, kind of a general talk. I have some general ideas. Not all the work is done, but like most researchers, I'm always thinking of ways to extend the models, to continue to improve them, maybe take them in a new direction. I've worked for many years, as some of the people know, in optimization, in reliability optimization. Um, I actually gave two, two exams today to my students at Rutgers, one in nonlinear optimization. And, and I have students actually taking an exam right now uh, in, in applied optimization. So the types of work I like to do is to study reliability, study maintenance, preventive maintenance, and more recently resilience or resiliency. And, and tried to apply our optimization models to make some improvements. Just very quickly, I'm hoping, I'm hoping everyone listening to me knows about uh, Rutgers University, but maybe some do not. And just very quickly, we are uh, the state university in New Jersey. Look at the map um, down below, circled in red. Um, we are one of the largest universities in um, Northeast America in terms of enrollment. We're very, very big. We're also one of the very oldest universities in America. We were founded in 1766, which makes us older. Rutgers is older than the country I live in, um, which was founded in 1776, 10 years uh, later. Now, I've worked um, for many years, mostly reliability. That's been my primary research area from even before I got my PhD in optimization. And about 10 years ago, I was funded to work in a research study where my system reliability project became the electrical power grid and more specifically, the electrical distribution system. Well, that was many years ago when we didn't really think of resilience as a, as a hot research topic, but we do now. And so I've tried to combine some of my research areas in these different, um, different fields uh, to get some interesting new results and publish some research papers. This is my talk today. I'm gonna to start with just some very general concepts 
and then talk primarily about two different initiatives that are um, certainly related, uh, but they're also related because in both of them, I apply uh, two-stage stochastic programming to solve the problem. Now, if you don't know what that is, I'll explain that. Um, but it's both appropriate for these models and also new. It's a new approach that uh, has not been used. So this is my overall talk. I probably, like I always do, have more slides than I have time for. So I apologize ahead of time. Uh, I'll finish on time. I'll finish on time to respect the next speaker, but I'll probably need to rush towards the end. I'm, I've been doing this for many years. I, I, I still haven't learned. Now, let me start this way. I'm going to start very general concept. Look at the diagram I have here. If you have a very big problem, big, too big to solve, uh, maybe an engineering problem, maybe even a problem in your personal life, and it's too big, you know, you can't, you can't deal with it. How do you solve a big problem like that? What you do is you break it up. You break it up into smaller problems, right? And then you say, well, I can deal with each of these smaller problems independently. And maybe then collectively, when I'm done with all of them, I will have solved the big problem too. Now, we all know that. We all know that. Let's break up the big problem into smaller problems and then solve them one at a time. But let's think about that. When I break the big problem up to small problems, first I'll solve one of them. See that little symbol? That means I've solved that problem. But when I solve that problem, it creates constraints for other problems because those decisions have been made. And, and so the solution to those problems might not be optimal. But, and then when I solve those problems, it creates constraints for the other problems. And then finally, when I solve the final problem down there, the purple box, maybe the solution's not so good. Maybe the solution's not so good because I've already made these other decisions. So when we solve problems this way, break up a big problem and a small problem, solve the small problems individually, look at the bottom of my slide, each of the solutions to the small problems create constraints for the other sub-problems. Now, before I go on, is this a good way to solve problems? Take a big problem, break it up to small problems. Oh, yes, of course it is. Of course it is. We build, our society builds big buildings this way. We put people in space. We, <laughs> you know, we can build wonderful systems, but we need to recognize that when we do this, there's limitations. Now, imagine once again, we've taken the big problem, broken it up into small problems and solved them individually. Now look at the two problems I've circled. The yellow one, when I solve that, it creates constraints for the purple box. Well, maybe I don't need to do that. Now watch my slide. Maybe I can combine those and solve them simultaneously, and therefore consider that the constraints, when I solve the yellow, yellow trapezoid, I can kind of, I can solve them together and get a better solution than solving them individually. Now look at the bottom of my slide. What are some examples of this? Example one, reliability system design and maintenance planning. Often, and, and often, not always, and certainly if you look at the models researchers like I write, uh, papers that I write and others, often we think of reliability optimization, but then when we um, devise a maintenance, an optimal maintenance plan, it's assumed the design decisions have been made. But maybe we should make those decisions together in an integrated model. I think I can convince you of that. Maybe not everyone. The second one will be harder for me to convince you of, but I'm going to try today. I've only got limited time. 
But when you have infrastructure like the electrical power grid, and we occasionally have these extreme events. In America, we recently had a winter storm in Texas that was terrible. And in New Jersey, where I live, we had a terrible hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, a few years back. Some of the towns still have not recovered. Um, and so they're spending money to do hardening. Hardening is a fancy word for make the system more robust and more reliable. But then when the extreme event does occur, the decisions are restoration. What can we do to get power? Um, what can we do to get power restored as quickly as possible? Now, the hardening decisions are made prior to knowing what the extreme event is. So anyways, now I'm just going to show some simple examples. But for the first case, for system reliability design and preventive maintenance planning. Again, if the, what often is done, and I see RAP, the redundancy allocation problem, and PMP, preventive maintenance planning. Now, not always, not always, but at least the analytical models we do, watch my slide, we do the reliability design, we get an op what we consider to be an optimal design, and then do the preventive maintenance planning. Now, again, if there was someone in the audience from Boeing Aircraft, he would raise his hand now or, or and say, David, you're, 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 you're crazy. <laughs> we always do that. I know, I know. But I'm thinking of the analytical models we use, the papers in journals the journal papers for preventive maintenance planning, for unconditioned maintenance, for predictive maintenance, assumes that the design exists and has been fixed. And yet, if we could optimize the maintenance, realizing that the design maybe could also be changed, we can get a better plan. Both of them impact life cycle cost. And I'm proposing integrated approach such that if we make the decisions for design and the decisions for maintenance together, we can get better overall approaches. And I can prove that or demonstrate that, I should say. Um, now, I'm sure I can convince you of this. This will be more difficult. Now, what do I mean by hardening? That's a common term, at least in America, for the, uh, the, the electrical power industry. It can be very simple things. Take a substation, raise it up so it's elevated, so that when the next flood or hurricane comes, it's less likely to fail. It could even be simpler than that. More aggressive uh, trimming of the trees near transmission lines. But it could also be more sophisticated. Um, and it could be build a redundant transmission line. Or in the case of the power grid in Texas, when, when they had the outage in Texas, which was what, one month ago, the wind turbines stopped working. And there were some people in Texas that said, see, wind turbines aren't reliable. And yet the wind turbines in Minnesota and Wisconsin, where it snows all the time, were still working fine. It's because they didn't design them to have that. So they call that now weatherization. So that's hardening. And when people do hardening, absolutely, they're trying to consider resilience. I'm not saying they are not. But the research papers for resiliency involve a restoration policy. That means when there's an extreme event and multiple failures happen simultaneously, dependent failures. In the repair actions can't be done simultaneously. There's too many of them. We need a restoration policy. What do I mean by that? Maybe you want to repair those that can be that, that service the most customers. Maybe you want to repair first those that have the shortest repair time. Maybe you want to divide those. The customer service divided by the repair time. Maybe something else. Um, but when the restoration and resilience 
strategies are optimized. The hardening's already been done. It's assumed that it's, it's we have, a, again, a fixed design. Now, you could argue, of course, we just had a hurricane. We just had a tsunami. We can't think about changing the design. We got to get power on. True, true. But in between the extreme events is when these hardening decisions are made. And of course, we don't know what the next extreme event will be, but they both impact life cycle cost. And if we make our hardening decisions and our um, conclusions on what are good effective restoration plans simultaneously, we'll get a better one. Now, I do have work for one and two. I don't have work for three. Notice future work. But maybe we can extend even further. We have a design and we may harden that design. The design needs regular preventive maintenance or on condition maintenance. Those decisions maybe can be done simultaneously. But at the same time, we consider that there may be these extreme events with many failures, multiple failures. Now we wanna do the hardening to, to minimize that, but given they still do occur, we need an optimal restoration policy. So let's combine all those. Sounds like a good PhD. Now, I solved these problems using um, two-stage stochastic optimization or two-stage stochastic programming rec recourse. Now, what does that mean? Two things. Well, more than two, but a minimum of two things. There's two types of, there's uncertainty. There's uncertainty. And we have two types of decision variables, stage one decision variables. Those that we have to make considering the distribution of uncertainty. I know there's uncertainty and I have to make decisions given that in certain environment. The stage two variables though, I can wait and see. Oh, I've observed the uh, uncertain environment and I can act in response to that. Now, two-stage stochastic programming with recourse means we're going to combine them into one cohesive model. Now, does this happen? Are there examples of systems like that, that where a two-stage stochastic optimization would be appropriate? Because I'm telling you from someone who um, reads journal articles, write journal articles, I'm editor now for, well, excuse me, associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Reliability, Journal of Risk and Reliability. Yeah, lots of examples. Um, you look at this airplane design, we have stage one variables. We need this reliable design, but maintenance, we can see, whoa, this is deteriorating more than we had thought. The stresses are greater than we thought. We can adjust maintenance accordingly. Here's Texas, uh, just one month ago. Uh, stage one variables, the system hardening and robustness. Stage two variables, whoops, we have observed this uncertain event. What's the most effective policy to restore efficiently? Lots of other examples, aircraft launching, electrical power grid with, with climate change. IT installations with, 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 with many, many um, uh, disk drives getting hotter. We don't know maybe the future uh, utilization of those systems, even some hardware systems. Now, it's hard for me because you know, I'm a professor. And, and again, even just today, I'm, I gave an exam on nonlinear optimization. I'm gonna to try to have very little mathematics, but there'll be some, there'll be some. So uncertain usage stress profile, just, just a few notations, capital U bold. I have a vector. I have a vector of uncertain stresses. How many stresses? C, so I have this vector of uncertain stresses. There's an infinite number of possible future combinations of these stresses, but, I can't deal with that if I'm gonna optimize. So I'm gonna define what we call scenarios of the infinite number of possibilities. I'm gonna select V, what I call a scenario. These are typical outcomes 
that if I think of all V of them together, they can represent the uncertainty in this future environment. So again, in practice, infinite, infinite number of possible future outcomes of these uncertain variables. But I'm gonna select V of them and each vector V, each of the V vectors has, so there's C different stress variables and, and V possible future outcomes. Again, really there's an infinite, but I'm gonna select V of them that will represent the uncertainty in the right proportion. Okay. Here's some examples. This is a, the first one on top is a paper I wrote on uh, uh, with Shuya Li and Frank Felder on uh, expansion of the power grid given climate change. Now there's an infinite number of possible scenarios with climate change. We picked five of them. You might say five. That doesn't seem like very many. Well, because we needed to justify them with scientific projections. So five is probably not enough, but, I, but five was the number I could use. The one on the bottom, uh, I guess that would be, a, I guess I've referenced his MS thesis, but a, a, an MS student, Akira Hara, where we did the aircraft launchers on an aircraft carrier, where the future stress profiles are changing. So in both instances, I've defined these scenarios. Let me move on. Here's, here's one research paper I wrote. This is, I don't know if it's the only one, but one of the few research papers where I'm optimizing system reliability um, given the components within the system uh, are a function of these random stress profiles. This is written with uh, uh, my former PhD student, Nida Shatwatanasari, and my colleague from, from Thailand, Naruman Wat Watanapangsakorn. If anyone in the audience is from Thailand, I apologize, I did my best with those names. Um, uh, uh, Professor Watana Pangsakorn is at KMUTT in Bangkok, where I have visited many times, many times. So this is a paper where we introduce this idea that the reliability of the components and then the system is a function of these uncertain stresses, an explicit function. Okay, let me move on to the next part of my talk. This is work that has been done, probably the only part of the, my talk where the work has been done. Combined redundancy allocation problem, preventive maintenance planning. This is work that actually the original ideas came to me when I was a visiting researcher at KMUTT in Thailand. But then they further developed, and then we actually got some real work done when I was a visiting researcher at UCAS, University Chinese Academy of Science with Xiaoyan Zhu. Um, so we have these traditional analyses, system design optimization, and we have these traditional analyses on maintenance optimization. You can look at the diagram. So we have redundancy allocation, reliability allocation, we have maintenance. Now, if you think about them, watch, watch my slide, the decisions are sequential. We, we, we have models to optimize the reliability, we have models to optimize the maintenance given the design has been fixed. And what we said, well, well, maybe we can integrate and combine those. Well, how? Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm selecting the redundancy allocation problem because I'm very experienced with it, um, but it's just one problem. I don't mean to imply it's the best one. It's the one I selected. But the redundancy allocation problem is where you select the components, levels of redundancy to maximize system reliability subject to some constraints. If that's a deterministic problem, you can see that the upper part of my table in yellow, I say hundreds. Then I, then I thought about it when I prepared this slide, I said thousands maybe. <laughs> yeah, I've written about a hundred and um, but if you make it stochastic, fewer, fewer. If it's a one stage stochastic, I think, I don't know, but one of the first papers was written by me in, in 1997 when I was a, a new professor, where we 
try to maximize a lower bound on system reliability. But then when we move to this two-stage stochastic, very few papers, and there's two um, you see down at the bottom, both with uh, my colleague and friend, Xiaoyan Zhu, and then some, some uh, others. And my former student, Nita, Nita Shatwatanasari. As I said, the redundancy allocation problem is, um, you know, you look at the bottom, I have system reliability, capital R, it's a function of, of bold X, a vector, a vector of design decisions, whatever they may be, which components to use, which architecture to use. Um, and so when you look at the bottom part, we have some, we have S to find functions we need to satisfy for this system. And we're gonna decide which components to use and then how much redundancy. And often the answer is no redundancy other than for those that are critical. So my diagram is not really too accurate. And then we have preventive maintenance planning. Now, again, I'm showing the most simplistic model which says there's an appropriate time with which to perform some maintenance action. Uh, that's just, again, one example. Now we have more sophisticated methods, which are better, predictive maintenance, on condition maintenance, other things, other more sophisticated tools. But for my talk today, we we're, we're just have a very general model. And you look at the graph in the lower uh, right, this shows maintenance costs as a function of when to perform maintenance given these different uncertain scenarios. So if it turns out it's more stressful, the most, most stressful scenario, which would be the upper uh, uh, curve, um, it's more appropriate to perform maintenance at a different time than a more stressful. This is why we consider this a second stage decision variable. I can observe this uncertain stress environment or usage environment and make maintenance decisions accordingly where the first stage variables design, they've been made, they've been made. So we're designing the system structure, we're simultaneously considering design and, um, and when to do maintenance. The first stage decision variables, which components? Uh, how many to use if and if we have redundancy. The second stage, for those that we use, when is an appropriate time for preventive maintenance? Now, in practice, the first stage decision variables need to be determined first, but I can integrate them together. Here, here's a more recent paper. This came out in 2019 uh, in European Journal of Operations, Operational Research, it's Europe. Um, where we had a risk averse, it's the problem I just showed you. We had a risk averse um, objective function, CVAR, if you know what that is, the conditional value at risk. So this is, um, well, 2019, and that's an extension. So that's with uh, uh, Xiaoxing Bei, Xiaoyan Zhu, myself. And that's an extension of this paper in the IEEE Transactions on Reliability which is the first paper we did on this topic. And this work was primarily done when I was a visiting researcher at um, UCAS, University Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing. Now, again, let's not worry too much about the equations, but capital R, reliability, we see can be a function of capital U, this uncertain stress vector. And this is just the equation, don't worry too much about it, for um, a series system reliability. Now, the second equation you see, this is the reliability okay. for okay. one of those scenarios. Now, remember, there's an infinite number of possible um, future stresses, capital U, but I've defined V scenarios to represent that uncertainty. And so for each of those V scenarios, so you see for the second equation, R is a function of UL. Oh, the L scenario, which is a defined set of stresses. Um, and then we can, in the third equation, think of the expected value given those different scenarios. 
Okay, quickly, um, I suspect many, but not everyone knows the Weibull distribution. Um, uh, so this is review, but look down at the bottom. See that in red? Remember that equation. We have a shape parameter and a scale parameter. That's a component reliability. Now, see the same equation up at the top? But now the scale parameter is a function of this uncertain stress um, vector, which means for a particular scenario, which is the second equation, I then have these fixed stresses. And then finally, look down at the bottom, the shape parameter, I'm sorry, the scale parameter, that's the Greek letter eta, is going to be a function. And this is the function we selected. I can justify it. Um, of these stresses that are uncertain, that are uncertain. And the alpha parameters are sensitivity. Some components are sensitive to those stresses, some are not. All right, let's go quickly. I have these future stresses, some relate to the environment, some relate to mechanical loading and stress, some operating conditions, how I use them, doesn't really matter too much to me. Well, I, I mean, how my model works. Um, I can integrate them into one model. And here it is. Again, don't worry too much. I don't have time, even if you did worry. I have the construction cost, the design cost, but notice the notation A slash P slash I slash N. For those of you who've taken a course in engineering economics, I've taken an upfront cost and prorated it over some time horizon using the concept of equivalence. But then next to it, notice that's an expected value given this uncertain stress. Now that's the maintenance cost rate, but it's gonna vary depending on what those stre stresses are. So this is the expected value. But the beauty of the scenarios, and this is why people who study stochastic programming use scenarios, is that instead of having to integrate, over this, you know, this, well, it'd be unknown anyways, but instead of having to integrate over this joint probability density function of these stresses, I can sum, I can sum over the scenarios, which means if the rest of the model is linear, um, well, which it isn't in this case, but, uh, but some of it is. So I have this model, now look down at the bottom. The expected, maintenance cost rate, I need to sum over the maintenance cost for the different scenarios. And now notice lower uh, right where it says recourse function. This is a separate optimization problem. I need to minimize the uh, over Y, which is the preventive maintenance time, the cost rate. Now, if you haven't studied stochastic programming, you'll have to take my word for it. I can integrate these all together, solve it. I won't talk about this other than to say the objective function is really difficult. It's nonlinear, it's intractable in places. Is it convex? I don't know. Probably, I suspect it is, but I can't prove it. Um, difficult to solve. So what did we do? I, 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 I would love, like I taught, I'm teaching this semester to use gradient-based, derivative-based search algorithms. But here, we use derivative-free optimization. And so we studied those. Here's a list. The student I asked to do this, which was a, a Chinese student, Xiaoxing Bei, he said, should I just pick the best one? And I, I disappointed him. I said, no, 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 we have to solve it every way because you know we're not, well, we are engineers, but we're not working for a company. We just need a good solution so we can move on to the next job. We're researchers. So we need to, we need to solve it each way because we're not gonna know if we have the optimal solution. So these are all examples of derivative free optimization. I think all of these softwares are, are in the public domain. They're free, I believe, or we got the free version. And 
Now I'm going to solve very quickly. This is the simplest solve problem we solve. We solve much more difficult problems. This is the simplest one, but I'm but I'm I selected this one so I can show you quickly. This is just one subsystem, one parallel subsystem. I have three different components I can use. I can pick any of the three. I may or may not use redundancy. I can mix and match. I can use two of one, one of the other. I can use two of, you know, whatever. All combinations, it's combinatorial. There's three future stresses. And I've, again, an infinite number of possibilities, but I've selected four scenarios to represent the uncertainty. That's what you see in the table. Now, we solve this for each of them. Now, notice, and this was a small problem and they didn't all converge, but three of the five did to the same solution. Is that the optimal solution? I suspect it is, I can't prove it. Now, look over here. This is the computation time. The nomad is an order of magnitude longer. So you could argue it gets the same solution and takes an order of magnitude longer. Maybe that's not a good choice. And if this was the only example we did, I would agree with you. But we did many more examples. And as the problems got bigger and bigger and bigger, Nomad kept getting the best solution where the other ones that were very efficient for the small problem, actually it's eventually wouldn't converge at all. Okay, let me move on. Um, I, guess I need to move faster. This was something interesting. Um, before we published the paper, I told, we said, well, wait a minute. We're claiming this is better. We can't say it's better unless we can see what the solution was if we didn't integrate them. So we first did reliability optimization, then did maintenance. And so we did that. And this, the student didn't want to show me the results because look down at the bottom, the, the final column is percent improvement. He didn't want to show me these results, zero. And I said, no, 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 that's okay. Our integrated approach doesn't always give a better solution, but sometimes it does. Sometimes it's the same. Sometimes if you optimize the reliability design and then maintenance, you get the best solution. But sometimes we can get improvement. And that was enough, that's enough. Now, let me move on. This is very recent work. In fact, the two papers we're doing, one is under review right now. If you're a reviewer in the audience, accept, accept, you don't need to read. And then <laughs> the other paper, um, we're kind of waiting to get our review back on the first paper before we submit the extension to that, but uh, it, the work's done. Uh, but this is the combined infrastructure hardening and resilience. This is, this is what I view as what I'll be working on next year or the year after that. So we have these complex uh, infrastructure systems, electrical power grid, it could be a water system, it could be a net, it could be airport, air, airport network. Although, you know, we could apply models, something like this. There's uh, forms of dependency. Among these, mostly I worked in the electrical power grid because at Rutgers, my university, we have this center, a center of uh, an energy center uh, that specifically works primarily for the state of New Jersey on the electrical power grid. And so I have lots of good applications and good data. Now, this is similar to the other diagram, but now, on the left, system design hardening. What are the types of analyses done? Let's maximize the reliability. And the word reliability is used in a different way in the uh, electrical power grid. It's really more of an availability was what we teach in the textbooks. Or minimize the loss of LOLP, the loss of load probability. Let's get a good reliable design. There was a time when the idea was the best way to have a resilient system was to have a reliable system. And sure, on average, that's correct. As the systems get more and more reliable, they'll probably be more resilient too. But given 
some of the recent extreme events, we realize, no, 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 that's not enough. Yeah, sure, you want the grid to be reliable, of course. But the actions you take to improve the resiliency are not necessarily the same. Anyways, we have the system hardening. What are some decision variables? Maybe build a redundant transmission line. Maybe use more reliable components. That's, that's, that's easy. But even if you say you do that, well, which ones? Which ones? There's many components. The least reliable? That's actually not probably the best way to do it. Those that have the most connectivity in the network? Oh, that, that, is, a better, that is a better way to do it. And then you have the analyses. The restoration, I use the word restoration. You know, usually the papers would have resilience or resiliency in the title. And often what are they usually trying to do? We want in some defined time period to show the maximum restoration, the ability to, to, to return to the, the previous state. Or we may want to minimize restoration time where we're gonna to restore to one minus alpha of the original uh, um, performance. And what are some decision variables? Well, what is my restoration policy, most importantly? What, who, what do I repair first, given that I've got multiple repair actions simultaneously? And do I assign more workers? And if you certainly look at the research papers, these decisions are sequential. But maybe we can integrate them. So here's our two-stage model here. First stage, the pre-disruption hardening measures. And we don't know what's going to happen. But then the disruptions occur, but we, there could be multiple. You know, you, you one, you two, you many. Now, we don't know what they're going to be, of course. We don't know what the next one's going to be. But we can simulate possible events with a random number of components that have been disrupted. And once again, we can integrate this into some form of a two-stage stochastic model. Now, this is for those who have worked in uh, resilience, like Professor Tang and many others, uh, common graph, what's capital Q? Well, it's, it's, it's system specific, but capital Q is some measure of performance for the electrical power grid. It could be number of customers served or the amount of energy used by those customers. But at some point, there is a disruption. There's this immediate loss of performance. Uh, we have events that are very much dependent events. Many things fail simultaneously, not due to uh, any inherent failure mechanisms, but due to this external stress that has been imposed. And then we restore capability. Now this in this graph at T1, we restore up to 100%. You know, sometimes we might restore to one minus alpha or some uh, level, maybe not quite to the 100% because we can, um, we can continue to perform at an adequate level, maybe not at 100, 100%. So the shaded area we say is the resilience loss. Now, here's a metric we used in our paper. Again, you see on the left, a similar graph that I showed. And then we, we, we show this uh, a red area. So that's the resilience loss. And then if you look at, the, um, the lower amount, we create this kind of blue rectangle. And we have this, this, this R measure, a script R, the proportion of the lost system performance caused by the disruption, or that would be the red uh, uh, a shaded area divided by the blue rectangle. So a smaller value, the better. If that's a smaller value, our restoration policy has been more effective. And so this is, this is the, the metric we use. This, 
as some of us know, um, there isn't really a, an agreed upon set of metrics. There's many different metrics for resilience, or you could say resilience C, which is what I always used to say. Now, this is one paper we've read. Notice March 2021, so that's just last month. So this is resiliency-based restoration optimization for dependent networks systems against cascading failures. This is work um, by Jen Zhou. Jen um, is now a professor at the Nanjing University of Science and Technology in Nanjing, China. Uh, excellent former student, excellent researcher. If he's listening now, let me say excellent another time. And uh, he's now written many papers. And in fact, we have many more to write. He wrote other papers going back to his MS um, thesis at Beihang University on cascading failures. But this was the first paper on the restoration optimization were given cascading failures, which propagated through the network. Oh, I need to finish soon. So, um, so we had these cascading failures. I was watching the, my watch, and then I somehow, once I get talking. So here's an example, 2003, I've got a wonderful story. I'll have to wait. I was on an airplane from Seattle to New Jersey when this happened. <laughs> and when we landed, we didn't know. So look at the top figure, that's regular. And then everything went out. Now, let me finish this up quickly. We have the hardening to improve the reliability and vulnerability. Then, then in this instance, we have the cascading failures. It affects the vulnerability and the recoverability. And then we have the restoration. So we formulated this, as you know, from my talk into this two-stage stochastic optimization. First stage, second stage, complicated mathematical model. I don't have time to talk about, but hardening cost, after disruption cost. Notice that's a sum over scenarios. The scenario is the severity of the extreme event. So we have functions for these costs. And of course, let me cut to the, the, the hardening strategies. How do we decide which components to improve and how many? Restoration, shortest repair time, high degree node, first failure, first in, first out, others. Once again, there's a difficult problem. It's simulation-based optimization. We use the genetic algorithm. I very much would like to solve this using a more uh, rigorous, sophisticated methods. We solved some problems. We got really good solutions. And here's what's interesting. Depending on the severity of the extreme event, the restoration policy is different. That's pi one, pi two, pi three. U one, U two, U three are different extreme events with different severities. If it's not so severe, U one, Shortest processing time, shortest failure time. That's, or um, I forget, or, or most customers, uh, most customers affected. On the other hand, if it's big, look at the, the, uh, the position in the node, the degrees, fix those in the network that have the highest number of connections. Okay, let me finish my talk. I'm right on time, although I had to hurry. Future research. If you're interested in this, come help me. Pandemic's over? Well, not yet, not yet. When the pandemic's over, come visit me at Rutgers, except for not all at once. One, data-driven. Instead of two stages, I want this to be multiple stages where we continue to update our model as we get new data. Future research two instead of a time to failure distribution, a degradation model, like a gamma process. Future research three, combine them all. Design and hardening, maintenance planning, resilience. Combine them all, get a PhD from Rutgers maybe. Okay, thank you very much. I believe I'm right on time.
<laughs> and so that concludes uh, that concludes my talk. It's 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 um, traditional to have a slide that says can thank you or something like that. I don't have that. So um, so let me. Um, I can't find. I'm gonna. Oh, there it is. Stop share. So that concludes my talk. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Coy. So Dave, I I have uh, a few questions in mind, in fact, but then uh, before I ask them, I'd like to open the questions to the audience. All right, um, you know, because of the time difference, uh, I think many audience, uh, we are at GMT plus eight, but the uh, the timing in the program is G <laughs> GMT plus nine, you know, uh, Japan time. So um, I'm, I'm seeing, you know, uh, overwhelming response right now. Um, and I believe uh, many of our delegates, uh, audience, they, they, they have questions for you. All right. Um, and is there anyone would like to uh, raise the first question or you'd like to type your questions uh, in the chat? In the chat yeah, box? Yeah, I, I, I just opened up the chat. So. Um... Certainly, someone can send it there, and you know. And also, let me say, um, you know, time is going to be somewhat constrained, but um, I'm always responsive to email. If someone would like to contact me or get a, you know, and, and ask a question, I'm, you know, like most researchers, we're happy when people are interested, and so I'll be glad to. Right, right. So. Um... Since uh, no one is asking any question, let, let, let me ask my first question. Um, it is a very interesting talk. In fact, uh, very inspiring. Uh, you know, I, what I had in mind is this. In some cases, uh, the decision may not be sequential. Uh, you know, when you look at system design, you could have design in residence. And uh, residence, in, in fact, com comprises uh, a few dimensions, as you mentioned, there's a robustness, there's a reliability, there's a restoration, there's a recovery process, and there's also something that uh, could incorporate learning, right? So the learning part, yes, I totally agree with you that the learning part would, is, a, is, is a sequential decision because you need to learn from past events. But for the other uh, dimension of uh, resilience, you, you could actually try to design in and thus the objective function that uh, you had in mind, uh, you know, could include uh, aspects of resilience and not just reliability. Uh, what, what, what do you think? Uh, maybe you'd like to comment well, yeah, on that. Yeah, that's why, like I mentioned, number two, I, I, I said it's going to be harder to convince you actually specifically you but i met the whole audience <laughs> because because for sure if you ask yeah. someone who was designing these systems if they consider resilience they would be insulted if i if i said they weren't of course they are but that doesn't change but let, so let me answer two ways so yeah of course they are that's the whole point of the hardening is to is to make these well is to actually make the system so they don't need to be resilient, to make them robust normally, but also, as you said, designed for uh, um, resiliency. However, the specific actions for resilience, like what is the optimal um, restoration policy? Uh, so I'll answer two ways. That, is generally not considered. What's considered is, and maybe you're gonna tell me I'm wrong, but what is considered is let's make these extreme events not affect the system so much where the resilience is, well, if it does, what if it does? What if this extreme event does cause all these simultaneous failures? Then all of a sudden, it doesn't matter. So I'll answer that way. And then the second way I answer as a researcher is, the papers we write, the papers we write on resilience and restoration with, I think, out a single exception, 
assumes we have a fixed design. And, and that's not wrong because when a hurricane hits, you can't change the design. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in between, in between the extreme events, that's when we simultaneously consider, okay. And, you know, in, in so while well for sure, the design considers resiliency, but it doesn't consider it in the form of an optimization model like I'm proposing. That's my answer. Thank you. We, we, we do have a question appearing in the chat box. Oh, and you, it sounds, uh, I, can, uh, I can read out to you. Uh, the uh, question is, uh, how can I know that solving a problem using stochastic programming is more efficient than robust optimization. Let's say, for example, the uh, robust approach proposed by uh, Dimitris uh, Persimus. Uh, well, at MIT. you know, yeah. yeah, robust optimization, stochastic optimization, you know, both methods to deal with uncertainty. Uh, I've mostly, as you can kind of imagine from my talk, uh, dealt with the uh, stochastic programming. Robust optimization is when we have uncertainty in the parameters in our model. And, um, and I view them as similar problems. And perhaps there's many problems that could be formulated both ways. In fact, one stage stochastic optimization and um, robust optimization really are attacking the same problem. Whereas robust optimization has the uncertainty of the parameters, one stage stochastic optimization is assigned a, usually a probability distribution or perhaps some scenarios. But the two stage stochastic optimization is, a, is kind of a, a unique problem and I don't think it's the same. Now, I don't claim to have the um, knowledge and experience of Professor Bertsimus. <laughs> And, and and if he was the one asking the question, I would say, "You tell me." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, but I view them as not the same question because I, although perhaps robust optimization can be reformulated to solve a two-stage problem, um, but that's what. And, and by the way, two stages is just an example. It could be three stages, four stages, multiple stages. Um, and, and I don't know what you mean by efficient, whether efficient means time efficient, I don't know, I have no idea. I suspect both of them will not be very efficient for a big problem. Um, if in terms of efficient, we mean getting better solutions, um, I guess I still don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but for the problem I'm doing, I feel very strongly, uh, and, I, uh, and I'm certainly willing to discuss it um, that the method I've chosen, the two-stage stochastic optimization, it, it fits perfectly. It fits right. perfectly. Okay. And, I think we, we have and, time for uh, uh, Dave. We have time for one last question, and uh, President Ming Xie, uh, you know, uh, has a question for you. So uh, we, oh, I think we, I know uh, him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you. A very interesting talk. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I review many of your papers and accepted most of them. Okay. Oh no no <laughs> no. Oh, oh, I get no, a reject. Uh, but I do have one question. Okay, it's uh, you know it's easy to develop complex system model, makes things uh, more and more. I mean, uh, complicated by adding uh, parameters and uh, you know uh, uh, parts and uh, subsystem. Uh, but given all kinds of uncertainties, so how accurate can we really be when we try to estimate reliability of uh, complex system? Yeah. And, and, and I'm in, in, in uh, Professor Xi, uh, what's your name again? He knows, <laughs> he, knows <laughs> he knows this. You know, I, I certainly, um, and sometimes I, I, I later when I look back at my own papers, yeah, yeah, often some of my models are very complex. And even I will say, like I can, well, I don't want to say an example with the public forum, but sometimes after the fact, I'll say I overdid it. This is too complicated for a practical problem. Now, um, but I still sleep well at night because like the talk today, these are good ideas. It's the, I, I think, it's the idea that's important as a, 
as opposed to whether my model can be quantified and get a good solution. I hope it can, hope it can, but I think it's still good. Um, it's still a good model, even if it, even if it's difficult to do that because it's the idea. And first, the second one, I'm still convincing myself, but for the first one of design and maintenance in a cohesive reliability model, I'm, that's a good idea. We need to do that more. And, um, and, and you're probably guilty of it too sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, in we fact, do as know, researchers. Uh, yeah. My suggestion but, is uh, in future, probably you can look into this uh, type of problems and you know, derive the confidence uh, interval and uh, you know, do more risk related analysis so that we probably can simplify the model and uh, you get uh, as good uh, solution as uh, people can actually use. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, because because that's a that's a great point, and and um, you know sometimes we can make an extension, and theoretically we know it's good. I mean, yeah, we know it's good, but for, in terms of a practical, in terms of a practical, is the difference meaningful to the person actually applying the model? And that's what um, we often don't know as researchers, you know? And, and then you have the other case where it is sometimes and sometimes it is not. Well, if that's the case, I still argue very strongly, it's a good model then. Because even okay. if in a small well, proportion uh, of the time. Well, uh, Dave and Min, uh, in the interest of time, right, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to, uh, you know, move on uh, because there are other speakers uh, lined up. Uh, in fact, the next speaker is myself. So, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, I I like to thank um, Professor Coit, all right, uh, for his very interesting talk. Uh, so let let's put our hand together and uh, and uh, thank him. Uh, there's a reaction button, uh, you know, in Zoom where you, you can actually uh, you know show your uh, emotion and uh, you know and and clap whatever you know. Uh, so I, I I believe you can do that. Uh, okay. Now um, now let 